going. Um, thanks very much for coming. Feel free to stay where you are or to move up, get up, um, help yourself to drinks anytime. Uh, closest bathrooms I can think of are the men's and the women's MUBC change rooms, which are out that door and just in that direction. So again, help yourself. Um, yeah, so uh, my name's T-San Ku. I'm a, a coxswain here at Melbourne University. I've only been a member for about three years uh, after moving to Melbourne from Sydney about seven years ago. And move, yeah, great move. Fantastic city. Love it. And um, I got back into coxing as a in sort of club level and, and master's level. Um, before that, I coxed about 20 odd years ago in, in Sydney and in, in Canberra uh, and coxed for school and then for um, AIS and, and, a, and the Australian team. So really enjoyed that, but then had a long break and really enjoying being back in, in the club and now the master's space. Um, but I, you know, the Yarra, I'd coxed on the Yarra when I was quite young and not knowing the water at all, it wasn't easy. That was just straight into, I think it was a Henley at the time where we used to race, I think three abreast Australian Henley down there and knowing which bridges to go through and, and steering well and, and trying to obviously cox and race um, well wasn't easy. And I think it's a stretch of water that you do need to know quite well. Um, so that's, not, that's only something you can get with experience. Having said that, there's some stuff that we can go over which I think would help you know, brand new coxswains. We've got some coxswains here from Albert Park College as well. So we'll talk about um, some traffic rules on, on the Albert Park Lake as well. Um, but a lot of what we're talking about is very applicable regardless. Um, we'll spend the first hour talking to uh, a syllabus, essentially, uh, that, is, that has been, I don't know if it's developed by Rowing Victoria, but certainly hosted on the Rowing Victoria uh, website. So that's a fantastic resource for uh, rowers, coaches and coxswains. Uh, so I thank them for that content, which we'll be referring to. It's also being taped uh, tonight, so it will be um, available on the Rowing Victoria website at some stage in the future. Uh, so just very briefly, the first piece of the agenda I was referring to, it's known as the Good Coxswain on the website and we're going to go through, and you can, you go to the website, Rowing Victoria website, there's an education tab and then a coxswain tab and that's where you'll find these 12 chapters actually but we're going to be going over chapters one to six tonight and at a high level you can see that's talking about the coxswain, the boat, how to steer, how to use your voice effectively, uh, preparation for getting on the water, launching the boat, landing the boat and general responsibilities uh, on the water and off the water. Uh, then we'll go over some of the waterways. So that first bit could actually take about an hour. Uh, but we'll move through it and I'm not going to read it, we're going to refer to it and it's a great resource that you guys can refer to at any time. When I started coxing at school right through to the Australian team I had a folder about that thick just full of paper and they had, I, I made photocopies of, of uh, maps and I drew on them, race courses and all sorts of stuff. All of that information is pretty much there for you now online, so you don't have to do that. But I would encourage you, when you've got a regatta, to refer to this information, to remind yourself of the information. There's a lot of information there. You just have to know where to find it and to spend some time looking at it. Uh, so then we'll also talk about the waterways. Obviously, the reason that this session came about is to increase uh, safety on the Yarra. Equally, you could talk about increasing safety on Albert Park Lake and during regattas. Uh, so we'll go over some of that. Um, yeah, so let's dive into it. So I've mentioned before the Rowing Victoria website, which is a great resource. I mean, there's tons of tabs here across the top, uh, but we're going to jump straight through to, uh, I think the first one was education, coxswains. And in there you can see, as you scroll down, here are all these little booklets on coxing, which is a fantastic resource. Um, I believe you have to do a coxswain course to be registered as a coxswain in Victoria, and that's a, an online multiple choice. It's a little, like all multiple choice things, it's, I mean, I didn't get 100% when I did it either, but um, I believe it refers to a lot of the content on here. But regardless, this is a great uh, reference site. So I've already brought those up, and what we'll do is we'll just open up the first one and have a quick look. 
Um, so as I said, there's a lot of information here. We're not going to go over all of it, but at a high level, um, these are the 12 chapters that I, re I referred to, and we're only going to go over the first six tonight. Uh, you, and in about a month's time, as we get to the end of term four, and you start moving into regatta season and racing season, I thought these other chapters, seven through 12, are probably more relevant. So we'll run a second session on those, and we can review any of the safety or racing information uh, or venue information or regatta information again in that second session. And that'll also be taped by Rowing Victoria, the safety and the, 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 the venues. Uh, and that'll be also hosted, uh, posted on the Rowing Victoria website separately. So let's just jump into it. Um, I haven't certainly poured over this information, so I'm gonna refer to it. Um, I'm going to assume that some people are coxing for the very first time. Would that be fair? So look. Please. Tracy, Sonia, Nick and myself yep. are in the development squad at Yarra Yarra. Right. So we've been growing since February uh, and, and Yarra Yarra would be a good idea if we came along here to learn the rules of the river. Yep. And there are some of us who want to continue on to be cops, but some of us just have right. background knowledge for us as well, so we're new into the sport. Great. So um, I ran one of these sessions uh, about a month ago and it was very interactive and that's great. Unfortunately, we're taping it tonight. It doesn't, there are no rules, but what I'm saying is, in general, if we can move through the no, content. No, 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 not at all, not at all. Please speak. But in general, if we can move through the content and then have Q&A at the end of, this, of the six chapters, because Jen has to go, yeah. we, can have, we can have half an hour of Q&A if you want. And, and then we'll go over the, the safety as well. But we'll move through this. Please ask questions, um, because that's why we've got a whiteboard. That's, it's, it's an interactive session, right? It is, but uh, we'll just keep moving through it, for, through it. So again, there are all sorts of boats. Uh, there are eights, there are fours, there are quads, there are pairs. Um, uh, you know, a pair has two rowers with one oar each, whereas a double has two rowers with two oars each. These are things that you kind of need to get to know. It's different coxing a quad than it is a four. Um, it's great, I think most schools now do start a lot of their um, rowing and coxing in quads, which is um, a better way to start to learn how to be a good rower, to learn sculling. Um, I started coxing a quad, which was great fun. Um, some stuff is still relevant. Stroke side is still stroke side. Bow side is still stroke, bow side but in a four where they've only got one oar each, obviously you have to use the stroke to touch it on stroke side and you have to use someone on bow side to touch it on bow side, whereas in the quad you can use any or all of, all of um, the rowers to do that. So these are the different types of um, boats that we have. Um, sculling is referred to as sculling, whereas um, when they've got one oar each it can be referred to as sweep. Uh, it's not relevant for APC, you do all of your rowing in, in quads. Um, but as a coxswain, you need to know these things because as a coxswain, you need to make calls uh, and stroke side, bow side, stroke, bow, two, three, can do different things. Do interrupt if you've got any questions as we move through. Um, so here again, a lot of regattas have weight um, uh, restrictions for coxswains. You need to be a minimum of 55 kilograms generally these days. When I coxed, it was 50 for, 50 for men, and then they upped it. Um, so I, even I have to carry weights now. So a lot of you guys will find that you have to carry weights. So find out when you're going to regatta, either from the website, from your coach, whoever, does this regatta have a weigh-in? And if it does, then you need to make sure that you have enough weights to get yourself up to this minimum weight. And you actually have to weigh in an hour or two hours in advance of your race. Otherwise, you could be disqualified. Beg your pardon? You just make the boat go slower. Yeah, so like, like, like a jockey, it's great to be on weight. Um, it's not great to be overweight. Um, the reason I got my start here was because we've got a great coxswain here, Graham, who um, he's very experienced and, and a great coaching coxswain. Uh, and they wanted to send a crew to the Nationals and it was going pretty well and he was a bit heavy so they replaced him with me. So that can happen obviously, but at, but at, you know, at, a, at a more senior level. Um, but the idea is to be on weight. 
so that you give your, your rowers every chance of moving the boat as quickly as possible from start to finish. Yeah, look, you know, coxswains, uh, I've always likened it to being a jockey. I mean, these get some different ideas here. Jockey is one of them. You obviously are only as good as your crew or your horse, if you like. You can only go that fast, but you can certainly make them go slower um, by making incorrect calls or, or, or making um, uh, the, the wrong call on a race plan. It's, it's an interesting role. You generally get the blame if something goes wrong and you generally don't get a lot of thanks if something goes well. Um, but it hasn't stopped me from being a coxswain or enjoying being a coxswain. Um, I, I love being involved in a, in a team sport when, when you get it together, you know, four people or five with a coxswain or nine people. Um, it's, pretty, it's a pretty good feeling. Um, plus, I just love, um, you know, sitting in the back of a boat or a front of a boat and going fast. It's, it's really good fun. But you do need to be aware that, you know, it has certain attributes. As a, as a coxswain or as a jockey, um, you can have the, the, you know, a very set race plan before you go into a race. But at the end of the day, it's your call whether you stick to that race plan or whether you perhaps need to change that race plan in the, in the heat of the moment. And that's totally your call. If you ask something of the crew, they will and should do it regardless. Um, and that actually speaks a little bit to this session, which is safety as well. So whatever happens, you are the person ultimately responsible for the safety of your boat, your, your people in your boat, other people on the water. That's kind of your responsibility in the, the day. So it's not a small deal, it's, it's important role. Um, and um, while you do have coaches around to help you, they're not always going to be there all the time, especially at regattas. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, you're the one with a microphone, you're the one who's telling the, the, the crew what to do. And you can certainly override what the coach says if you feel that the crew is in danger. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more to that as well. Um, but, you know, it gives some good ideas of the kind of roles that, that you have to play and the, and the type of, being a coach as well in the boat is really important as well. Once you learn more, you can add a lot of value by being a coach in the boat, not necessarily during a race, but at any other time. And a little hint there, a really easy way of being a helpful coaching coxswain is to just be aware and listen to what your coach is saying to the crew every session. There'll be stuff that comes up all the time. There'll be a person in the boat, for example, that the coach is always saying, you know, get your blade closer at the catch or do something with your hands. That is something that you can mention on, on your own once or twice a couple of times during the session. And there'll be a time where you start to figure out, oh, I can feel something happening with the boat or I can see something happening. If you see that they're, that they're lifting their blade up at the, at, the, at the catch every time and the coach is saying, get your blade down at the catch, you don't have to wait for the coach to say that. If you start to see that, make that call. Bow, blade closer to the, to the, to the catch. So that's the way you can start to add value even when you're a relatively new coxswain. We've talked about the boats a little bit. Do you guys have any specific questions about the boats? That, anything that really worries you or you've got no idea about at the moment? Uh, yeah, look, this part just talks about the fact that some boats are bow coxed, some boats are stern coxed. Do you guys have that, I think? Um, the major difference there really is in any stern cox boat, it's usually you've got um, some, some strings on either side of you that are attached to the, to the rudder. And generally, if you want to go right, you push forward on the right-hand side. If you want to go left, you push, or to use Australian terminology, if you want to go stroke side, you push forward on stroke side. And if you want to go to bow side, you push forward on bow side. You might start hearing somewhere about starboard and um, port side. That's their American term terminology. It's actually, though, terminology that they do use on the waterways. Um, so it is still relevant, but in rowing in Australia, it's stroke side and bow side. The difference when you're in a bow cox boat is you have a little tiller, um, a little metal rod. Um, generally, you push that to the side that you want to go. So if you want to go to bow side, you push it to bow side. If you want to go stroke side, you push it to stroke side. That's the 
main difference between a Bowcox and a Stern Cox boat. To go one step further, g'day mate, how you going? Good. Welcome. Um, got any questions? Just ask. As we go, anytime. So um, the main difference, obviously, is when you're a when you're a relatively new coxswain, you've got a lot more value to add when you're in the stern of a, co a boat. In the, in the bow, really all you're doing is, is steering. When you get, when you get a really, become a really good coxswain, you can bow cox and you can feel stuff that's going on and you know what they're doing and, and you can make a call there, but don't feel bad if you're in a stern cox boat because I feel you add a lot more value as a coxswain at school level in the stern. The main reason why they have Bowcox boats, just so that you know, is it's a better weight distribution when you're racing. So if you're in Olympic Games, you want a Bowcox boat because you want the boat to be as level as possible. That's why you have Bowcox boats. Um, but certainly don't feel like when you go up to a regatta, if you're in a Sterncox boat, don't feel like you've got anything less than the Bowcox competition because in actual fact, you've probably got more value to add there than you do in the Bowcox at, at, at that level. I uh, mentioned it before, you've got stroke side and bow side. Handy hints, I still do it. I mean, when I think of stroke side or port side, I always think of red. It's just one of those things from coxing so long. And you'll see it as well, if you're in a stern cox boat, on the, um, they're called the collars of the, of the oars, where, where it actually sits in the swivel, um, which, which stops the, the oar from slipping out. It's usually red on stroke side, and same on bow side, it's usually green. So if you want a really quick way of telling which way side stroke side and bow side, stroke side's normally red, bow side's normally green. So if you want to make a call, you can say, touch it on stroke side, that's the red side, touch it on bow side, that's the bow side. To be a little bit more technical with the waterways, you've got pylons, red and green pylons. Um, someone might help me out here if I get it wrong. When you're heading upstream and this waterway that's upstream. Downstream is always towards the ocean. So downstream is ocean, upstream is towards the, the hills where the water actually comes from. Um, as you're going upstream, uh, you keep your green pylons on your right hand side, just as the bow, just as the bow is green. So you can see that when you're co coxing your boat from behind, from the stern, you're going upstream, you keep green pylons on your right on the green side, on the bow side, and you keep right red pylons on the left, on the, on the stroke side. You also need to be on the bow side of the river, generally. You don't go usually up the middle, and you certainly don't go over the left, but we'll talk about that more uh, as we go forward. Hi, how are you? Uh, there's water, coffee and tea up the back, so please help yourself anytime. Uh, so that's stroke side and bow side, and as you can see, you've got stroke seat. Usually, stroke seat is on stroke side, but you may come across sometimes a boat which is rigged the other way around, and um, that might not be the case. But generally, stroke is in the stro on stroke side, and stroke is closest to the stern of the boat, and in a stern cox boat, stroke is closest to uh, the coxswain. So there's usually, and in a quad as well, um, one of the strongest relationships you'll have is with your stroke. Um, it's a really nice, my best friend still after 20, 30 years is my stroke from school. Uh, because you spend so much time staring at each other. Um, well, actually as a coxswain, I spend a lot of time staring through him because as a coxswain from the stern, you've got a guy in front of you and you're trying to steer and not hit anything that you can't see. So you end up using a lot of your peripheral vision as well. And I kind of stare at the chest of the person in front of me and I can see everything else which is going on on either side. And at times you should have a really good look and make sure that there is nothing directly in front of you. The one time I've hit something, you know, I was out rowing on, on Sydney Harbour and there, it, was, it was very early in the morning, there was no one out. We're rowing along for a good sort of two kilometres towards a little fisherman in his dinghy um, and I didn't see him and he watched us row directly towards him for about 10 minutes until I hit him. Um, but that's because I didn't have a, a really, you know, good look around my rowers to see what was, what was out there in front of us. And, you know, you should do that every now and again. So uh, stroke side and bow side. Bow is the person at the right at the front of the boat or the bow of the boat. This is the bow ball up here, which is the direction 
of travel. It's the front of, of the boat. You should never, you should never get on the water without a bow ball. Um, at the end of the day, um, all these things are kind of your responsibility at the end of the day. A coxswain is very responsible um, and making sure that you don't get on the water without a bow ball is, is a little thing. The chances of it not having a bow ball are very, very low, but if you got on the water without a bow ball and you hit somebody, you could kill them. The, boat, the bow of the ball could easily go straight through somebody and kill them, and that's why we have a bow ball. That is really the only reason there are bow balls. It's not to stop the boat from hitting something, really. It's to save someone's life. Um, and so the bow person sits in the seat that's closest to the bow ball, then you've got the two person, or two seat, three seat, four seat. So that's the same in a quad as it is in a sweep boat. Bow, two, three, stroke. If you need them to do something, that's how you refer to them. I don't remember people's names in boats, and even if I do, I generally still refer to them by their seat. Stroke seat, bowman, bow seat, do this, do that. Um, uh, this is the oar. Again, I was mentioning it before. Um, I mentioned uh, the collar, uh, or the, which is sort of this sleeve and button area. That's, the sleeve is normally the thing that's either coloured um, or, uh, red or green. Uh, the blade or the spoon is the bit that they actually put in the water. Um, then they've got the, uh, the, the handle up here. The shaft is down here. Um, not much else I can tell you about that really, except that you know, it's nice for you to carry the blades down for them sometimes. I, I do that at regattas, um, especially if the boat's a long way away from where you're boating. They might carry the boat, you might carry the oars. It's a bit hard when you've got eight quad oars. It's a lot easier when you've got four sweep oars. But um, generally, they look after their own oars, but um, that's all there is to say about that at the moment. Stroke side, bow side again. Yeah. Look, there's some calls here. Have a, have a look at the end of each of these um, each of these booklets, because there's a lot of uh, terminology, um, and we might just we might just touch on each of them. Uh, but again, my handy hint would be listen to what the coach is saying carefully um, every session you go out, because you'll find a lot of this stuff is routine. So, for example, every time I go out in a boat, um, it's usually an eight. We warm up, so four of them will sit the boat up and four of them will, will start rowing. In quads, you might do that in pairs. Two of them might sit the boat up, the bow pair, and the stern pair might start off rowing. You might find that your coach gets them to start off from the back, which means that they're basically sitting at the back of the boat, they've got their legs flat, and they're just rowing with their, with their arms only. So generally, when I take the crew away from the pontoon, once, they've, once they're ready, we'll do arms only for maybe 10 or 20 strokes, and then we'll do bodies. So I'll just row with the bodies like that, keeping the legs locked down, and then they'll do quarter slide. So they'll take a quarter of a stroke, and then they'll do half slide, three quarter slide, and full slide. So taking a full stroke. My point there is there's some terminology there, which is referred to here, quarter slide, half slide, three quarter slide. But a lot of stuff that you can learn, you can learn by listening to your coach, and a lot of it is quite repetitive and routine and the rowers will get used to that. Get in the boat, we'll talk about, we might talk about it later, but I'll mention it now. You get in the boat, push off together, that's a call that you can make, or it's a call sometimes that the stroke or the seven person or the stroke or the three person might like to make, pushing off together. Once they're in the boat, as a coxswain, I always ask them to gear up, like get ready, gear up, get their feet in and, and get ready, and I ask them to number off when they're ready. So I basically, we push off and I say, gear up, number off from bow when ready. So basically what that means is bow gets completely ready and when they're ready they say bow and usually by the time they're ready everyone else is ready as well. So you'll, you'll hear bow, two, three, stroke. And once they've all, that means that they're ready to go. And once they're ready to go then you can start some of this warm up routine which might be warming up in pairs. Which again is something that your coach will probably do a lot of very consistently. So they'll get used to that, you should get used to that. You can hear the calls that the coach is making, they'll be very similar calls that you can make. And then it'll become second nature after a while. Um, yep, look, we've talked about some of these things. We've talked about bow st steering, uh, bow balls, cox boats. There are obviously coxless boats uh, that you need to be aware of. Um, 
at the end of the day, as a coxswain, you know, you need to be aware of everyone else on the water, whether they're coxed or coxless. Don't assume that because there's a coxswain that, that things are going to be easy and safe. My understanding is that most collisions on the water usually involve a coxswain. And I think that's because there's a level of complacency there on the behalf of the crew and of the coxswain. Um, and obviously, a lot of the time, a coxswain can't see everything that's going on because, as I said, most of the time, you've got four or eight rowers sitting in front of you, which, if you can imagine, cuts off like a, a huge, really big area that you can't see because from your eyes out to their shoulders and then further. So you need to look around and see what's going on there. You also need to stick to the the rules of the waterways is a really good way not to have a, a, a crash. So like all accidents, it's usually a combination of factors. One might be you're in the wrong spot or they're in the wrong spot, you're not looking at a certain thing, something distracts you, and then you have a crash. Uh, more glossaries. Yeah. So we might just see what this is. Yeah, so characteristics of a good coxswain. What a coxswain does, I've, as I mentioned, probably the, the main thing is safety, I, in my opinion, and to do that is steering. So steering is your, is, your, is your number one function. Number two is speaking. So you'll find that, well, I find that when something's going on, like when, I'm, when we're doing a racing piece down here and we're, we're trying not to stop, if there's a lot of traffic in front of me, the first thing I'll do is stop talking because I'm doing something else. I'm concentrating on not hitting something. So my primary focus is steering, using the strings or using the tiller. And if all else fails, that's the number one thing that I'm trying to do is not hit something. And, and, and safety is the number one thing. Number two is speaking, because um, you obviously need to speak sometimes. If you're going to hit something, then you need to stop the crew. You need to ask them to, to check the boat um, and, that, and check it hard and using the voice, which I think is another chapter we'll talk about as well, is really important. So as a coxswain, you want to have a few different voices. You want to have a very calm slash controlled voice. Uh, you want to have a, that's one. Another one might be a very motivating voice. That could be a different voice. And then third would be kind of an emergency voice. That needs to be different as well. And the crew will hear that as well. The crew will hear when you're getting excited. The crew will hear when you're getting worried. Uh, and certainly when you're asking them to, to check the boat or to check it to stroke side and stop rowing and not have a crash. But we'll, we'll come to that as well. Uh, so steering is number one, calls are number two, and calls can be coaching calls or they can be racing calls and we can talk about that a little bit as well. Um, you know, you will have a very close relationship with the stroke, you'll have a very close relationship, you should have a close relationship with the coach as well. So, um, you know, regardless of whether you like people or not, it's, it's good to try and, and foster those relationships. Uh, as I said, half of an, a beginner coxswain can be, what you say can be repeating what the, stro what the coach says. Um, but if, if you don't understand something, talk to the coach, ask the coach. That's what a coach is there to do. Not there, they're not just there to, to coach uh, the, the rowers from a, a strength and a, a technique perspective. They're also there to help help give you guidance to be a good, good coxswain as well. And if they don't know something, they can go and find it out. So ask them. Um, and you know, if you're really interested in these things, you want to be better, you, you're asking, how can I do better? So even when you do a good job, you can go, go and talk to your coach and say, I thought that was a really good session. I thought I did this well. You know, what else can I be doing? What can I work on next? Yeah, mate. Um, just with like the basket boats, Yeah, it is, absolutely. But I was saying earlier that I think um, it's harder being... It's, I mean, it's quite hard being a, a new coxswain in a bow cox boat. And the reason is you don't see what the rowers are doing. It's almost better to start in a stern co cox boat because you can see what they're doing and then you can say something about that or vice versa. You can say something and then you can see whether they do it. Now, I think what you're coming, where you're coming from is where that would be relevant would be certainly in a race, there are, there are calls as part of a race plan that you will make that are absolutely about um, pushing their legs or getting their legs down. Um, and that's obviously to increase the strength and the speed of the boat. So absolutely you'll have to make those calls. Generally when you're out there after school, do you row or before school? 
after school, when you're there after school training with your coach, you probably don't need to make that call necessarily. Um, but again, I would encourage you, listen to what the coach is saying. And if there's a couple of things he's saying, she's saying to a particular rower over and over again, there's a good chance that you could say that and get a good response from them as well. Or just remind them, like, you know, if the coach, if there are sections where the coach can't be near you or, or, or has gone quiet, you can remind them. Not all the time, you can just, you know, especially in a Bowcox boat at your level, I would just, yeah, I'd ask the question, are you, how are your catches in the two seat? If you've heard that the coach has been talking to the two seat about getting their catches in. Because you can ask the question, you can't see it. You can, you can see a little bit of their, their, of their catches when they come forward, just in the bow and the two seat a little bit, but not too much. Um, uh, and if you're really keen, there was a time where I actually put little um, rear vision, rear side mirrors on, on, on my Bowcox boat and I, could, and I pointed them so I could see the, the, the blade work because that way it allowed me to add more value. I could see if they were doing certain things and I could tell them to do it if they weren't doing it. But that's a little bit, that might be a little bit extreme. But um, yeah, there are, I would just say, listen to what the coach is saying and you can repeat some of that stuff to them and that would be helpful in training. And in racing, there'll be a race plan, which actually you guys need to know really well. The race plan is really your, you own that. Whatever is decided by the coach and the crew, which includes the rowers and yourself, will be a race plan. And you need to remember that or write it down and stick it in front of you because you need to call that race plan during the race. That is solely your responsibility. Rowers can barely speak and they shouldn't speak during a race. They should really not speak too much when we're out there um, practicing as well. Uh, and you need to call that race plan and you need to get a response from them. And if you don't, you need to ask for that response quite firmly as well. And that would absolutely include pushing the legs. So generally off in a, in a racing start, you'd, you'd, you'd have a, a racing start, maybe three quarter half, three quarter full. I don't know if you've done those racing starts yet, but once the boat's up and moving, one of the first calls is 10 on legs to really drive the legs and really get the boat moving. And then you might do 10 strokes on something else. Then at the 500 meter mark, you might do another 10, stroke, 10 strokes on legs. And again, just to mention it, one of the most annoying things for rowers to hear is a coxswain saying, let's do 10 on legs. One, two, three, don't count. Just say, on the next stroke, 10 on legs, on this one, drive the legs, push them down, knees down. So make calls, again, that you hear the coach say, or don't say anything. 10 on legs, starting on this one now. Legs down, push it, and then let them have, have a couple, couple more strokes, and then Keep driving the legs, snap them down, and that's what we're talking about, the different voice. So you've got your coaching voice, where you're just paddling up to the start, you know, you wanna keep them calm. You've got your racing voice, and then there are, there are calls you wanna make where you wanna get a response from the crew, and you have to, they have to hear that. And you have to demand it of them in your voice, and they have to give it to you. Is it worth like practicing that, like in the after school training, isn't it? Yeah, it's great if you can practice it. I've, I've always found it really difficult to practice these things. Um, you know, they're simulations. One of the best ways I would encourage you to start, if you can get your hands on some kind of waterproof phone or, or something and, and stick, it in, stick it somewhere that you can actually record your first couple of races, you don't need to share that with anyone. Just record it and listen to it yourself later on. Um, if you want to share it with your coach, that'd be great because they'll give you f some really good feedback uh, on it. Um, but um, if not, just at least listen to it yourself and think about how you sound and how you can improve. Uh, even at very senior levels, like to be selected, um, I think the part of the selection for the Paralympic crew, which is a co there's a Cox four that's going to the Paralympics, to be a coxswain for that, one of the, one of the criteria is to hand in a, a recording of, of some of your races. So it's a good thing to get in the habit of doing. Uh, totally. Yeah. 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 Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've gone through most of that. So as you can see, that's, that's, that's one of the booklets, uh, and we've already consumed about half an hour. Um, so we'll try and move a little bit 
faster through this. I'm not sure if you were here when I mentioned all of this information is on the Rowing Victoria website um, under education and coxswains. Okay? So really, again, the onus is on you to look up this stuff, read about it. If you've got any questions, ask your coach. I can give out my business card at the end as well, so if you want to follow up with me, uh, that's totally fine as well. Um, so just have a look what's going on here. So we, oh look, we've talked about the rudder. My comment on steering and the rudder is, you know, people say try not to use it as, as much as possible, and that is true. What I've found I do is I tend to have my hands on it all the time, and I make, I'm constantly making very, very little adjustments. That to me feels like you're in control um, and you'll start to see that when things start to happen, you can, you can react to that. Yeah, look, I don't, you wouldn't know this yet with driving, but maybe with, with riding a bicycle, it's the same thing. Humans tend to steer towards things that they're looking at. So if, you, if you're driving a car and you stare out the window, you'll basically steer off the road in that direction and the same is true with with coxing if you if you're rowing along and you're looking at your coach chances are you'll probably steer in that direction so yes i try to do find a, a point that's quite a big quite quite a big um, landmark that's in the in the so i know coming down here for example i think i look at one of these big trees out here that, that's that's above the rowers heads so i can see that there and i'm generally trying to steer toward that tree uh, because from a long distance away, that's quite a good reference point. Um, but yes, generally, uh, where you might start to have a new experience is when you start racing in lanes where you've got boys on either side of you. Um, I, think, I think there's probably about two or three metres on either side of your blades where the boys are, which is actually quite, quite wide, but it doesn't feel wide when you're a new coxswain racing in lanes and trying to go straight. Again, my comment there would be the way that boats react or work is that you've got, you've got the boat there, it's a four for example, you're coxing from the back let's say and you're going in this direction. If the boat, if the boat and the way that the, the boat moves is the rudder is here and it can go straight or it can turn. By the time the boat drifts off, off course a little bit and you correct it with the steering, the way a boat works is that the, the bum of the boat or the stern of the boat actually comes around first. So what I'm saying is that the way that I cox is to try and constantly make very small corrections because if you wait for the boat to be off course and then make a correction, by the time that happens with, with the rudder at the back, it, it, it can, the whole boat can move out of position a lot. So just try and get used to making small corrections as you go all the time to try and keep the boat in a, in a straight line. And yes, I would start with using a big landmark and trying to, to, to steer towards that. Sorry? So what's, what, what, is, what is that? Right, in there as well. It, oh. You know, if you've got trees, you know where you are, you can put the wave points along the way. Like an electronic device or something like that, or? You don't know what it's up. No. Okay. But, but tell us, what is, what is it? Well, just a normal navigation. You know how you've got your GPS in the car? Yep. Well, on, a, on, a, on the water, you can have a chart plotter. Right. You can chart the uh, river. Yep. You can put little dots along there where you want to go, the way yep, yep. and you can keep it in the middle of the river. Right. Yes, look, that's a great idea. Um, my general comment about that, certainly for a novice coxswain, is that a, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and another comment I would make about that is, eyes, I think eyes need to be up and out and looking, never sort of down looking at anything. So look, it's a great idea, the more tools you can have. But personally, I mean, I've coxed it at, at, at many levels and I like to keep things pretty simple in the boat. Like when they brought out, uh, when they went from a, a round cox box to that, that oblong thing, there was a lot of stuff going on, lots of buttons. That didn't help me at all. Like I just like to know the stroke. 
I like to know, sorry, the rate and have, and have a microphone. That's all I need to know. The rest I'm, I'm worried about is, is happening outside. Um, so yeah, look, any, any, any tool, tools are good. Um, yeah. The rudder. Uh, okay, so using the oar and, and, and uh, when, when you're stationary. So that's a rudder, talked about that. As I said, left uh, bow side, stroke side, push towards the direction you want to go. That's what this talks about here. And again. Yeah, so this is actually a little bit of, of again, have a read about this, about, about steering. So it's kind of saying, you know, start steering towards where you want to go a little bit earlier, don't leave it too late, because by the time the, the boat actually starts doing what you want it to do, you might have sort of missed where you want to go. Uh, this is probably just saying, you know, try and steer straight. Yeah, so this is good. these are some good points. So when will the, the, the rudder not work? When the boat's not moving. So the whole point of a rudder is that it needs, I think, an opposing force to work. And that, that means it needs to be moving. So my, my point for coxswains there is the way that you move the boat when the boat is stationary or not moving very, very, very fast is very different to how you move it when it's moving fast. So a lot of the, you'll, you'll experience that when you're, when you're launching the boat or when you're landing the boat, you'll need to use different methods. So you actually have to ask the, the, the crew to do things like touch it up or check it on one side. Whereas when you're actually rowing and the boat is moving, then you can use the rudder a lot more. You'll also see that the rudder is less effective when you're only rowing in pairs, for example, than you, when you're rowing all four. Uh, yeah, rudders don't work when you're moving backwards, really. Um, Look, little things, I would check. I've, I've gone out in a boat without a, believe it or not, without a, without a fin. So you, on the Yarra, um, I'm pretty sure at least some time in my life, I've hit a log and it's knocked the fin out of the boat. Um, the boat really can't go straight very well without a fin. Um, and someone might put the boat away before you and have knocked the fin out and then you get on the water you don't check the fin or you don't check the rudder, you don't check the bow ball, and you can go rowing without, without stuff. Um, so again, as a coxswain, when you're boating, it's kind of your responsibility to go around the boat, check that it's got a fin, it's got a rudder, it's got a bow ball, does the steering work? I go a step further and I plug in the cox box and I make sure that, the, that, that, that that works and that all the speakers are working. Because at the end of the day, if you get out in the water and one speaker's working or that it's not working at all, that's going to make your life pretty difficult um, and, I guess, affect the safety of the crew as well. So you can blame the equipment, you can blame the coach, but at the end of the day, it affects you and your crew and the safety of your boat. So I would take that upon myself to, to check that yourself. And if there's a problem, grab the coach, say, hey, I've tried the cox box and it doesn't work. You know, let's have a look at it. Uh, yep, it's not going to work very well when you're rowing in weeds. Um, you've got to be, you know, attentive all the time. Yep, and, and using it nice and early. This is what I talked about when the boat's stationary. You can use um, rowers to do certain things. And the most effective, if you want to move the boat to the left when it's stationary, then you use your bow person to do that. So at the front of the boat, if, you, if the boat's stationary and you want to go in this direction, uh, then it makes the most sense to use the bow blade to bring the bow, 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 boat, boat around. Less effect, if you use this one, the three person, that would actually make the boat move around, but it would make the boat move around slower. So you can see that this one here makes it go that way, this one here makes it go that way. So again, get used to it, try different things, but you will find that to do certain things, you need to use certain rowers. And probably one of the big ones is when you want the whole boat to turn around, when you want to do a 180, you basically, I use the words spin it to stroke side, but that's probably a little bit advanced for maybe some of your rowers. So you want to sort of say, all right, let's, sp let's spin the boat to stroke side. So touch it on bow side, both rowers, and back it down on stroke side. So these guys will be, will be backing it down, these guys will be taking it on, 
and the whole boat will, will move around. No, so, oh yeah, look, okay, so in a quad, the good reason for doing that is you can use the stern pair to keep the boat nice and level, and then yes, you could use, you could say to bow pair, bow pair, touch it on stroke side and back it down bow side, so they're going like this, both of them, and it will, it will move it around. And yes, the advantage of that is that the stern pair will keep the boat nice and level, it's not sort of doing this the whole time. But as they get better, all four of them should be able to take it on stroke side and back it down bow side and to slowly move the boat around like that. But yeah, that's a great way to do it to start with. Uh, and look, I think this is what this talks about as well, you know, where you'll get the most leverage. So it's all physics, you know, that's, that's really what it comes down to. The problem is being a coxswain's a bit like golf. The, the, the newer you are at it, the harder it is. The, bed, the, 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 the more experienced you get, the easier it becomes. So unfortunately, it's just going to be a bit hard and a bit awkward to start with, but the better you get, and actually the better your, your rowers get, then it'll all become a lot easier. One thing I would mention as a coxswain around this stuff is, when this is all happening, you don't want the rowers talking and you don't want them concentrating on something else. So these times might be the times where you actually say to them, right, everyone, stop talking. We're, we're launching now or we're landing now. Um, these are really times where you don't want them mucking around and, you know, this is not a fun time. This is a serious time about landing a boat well or, or getting off the water or pushing onto the water. These are times where accidents can happen. So there are times for having fun and in rowing that's usually after you've won a race and you're off the water. But a lot of rowing is relatively serious and I, because you know, it's a hard sport. The guys and girls are rowing hard and you've got a great responsibility as well. So there's a bit of time for fun, but certainly when you're adjusting a boat, it's probably not a time for the guys and girls to be mucking around. They need to be doing exactly what you want them to do when you want them to do it as well as they can. Uh, yeah, so checking the boat again, um, if you're about to hit something, you realise at the last minute, you kind of need to scream out to them, check the boat. Everyone, check it hard. And checking it hard, as you can see, basically means them putting the blades in the water as deep as they can while they're on the square blade. Just checking the, blade, the boat is a little bit like that. Now, the only comment I'd make about this is, my experience is when you're rowing along, if you want to check the boat, it's actually easiest to just put the blades under the water on the feather. That has a pretty good effect. To ask a crew to check the boat on the square means that the handle's gonna go into their stomach really hard. Uh, it is gonna stop the boat, but it's, it can be quite hard. So checking the boat can be done just as easily by them stopping rowing, lifting their hands on the feather, which puts their blades under the water. So instead of looking like that, it'd look like that but it'd be under the water. And just the fact of having four blades and four shafts in the water with them not rowing will actually slow the boat quite quickly. And then if you need to check it hard, you'll find a lot of them will actually square it up and have it under water and it will really put the brakes on. But look, maybe these are things that you should talk to your coaches about practicing. Like say to them, look, do you mind if we, if, we, if when we're rowing along today at some stage, we do a couple like where the coach and coach calls to check it hard and then maybe once or twice and then you get to do it maybe once or twice as well. I think it's a really good idea actually at this stage of the, of, of the term when you're just starting to row uh, for the first time. Yeah, checking it lightly, checking it hard. And again, a lot of glossary, a lot of um, terminology there. So easy, do you know that easy all basically means just stop rowing? So they just stop rowing, they don't check it. So under most circumstances, you don't really need to check it. You can just ask them to easy, easy all. Easy, it's, uh, it's easy all or easy or, it doesn't really matter, just easy. Um, and they'll stop rowing and the boat will, obviously the boat will keep moving. That's the difference with easy, it will keep moving, but it will start to slow down. 
And what I generally do is I ask the crew to, to easy and then I ask them to check it because they've stopped rowing, it's a bit more relaxed. They check the boat, they put the blades under the water and it pretty much brings it to a, to a stop. And even if it's still moving, what you can then do is you can actually say, check it on stroke side. So you use a little bit of the momentum that's still in the boat for it to start turning to one side and then you're already on a bit of an angle and then you've got less, less of a turn to make by spinning it to stroke side to start going back up in the other direction. All right, so that's uh, chapter two. Starting to move a little bit quick, quicker now. Okay, so this could be a short one, let's have a look at it. Yeah, so look, this talks a little bit more about now some of the, the voice sort of stuff. Um, Volume is important. I mean, I'm talking to you here now, and even when I'm describing things, I can hear, you know, I'm using different volumes for things. Um, when you're training, it's good to have sort of quite a consistent, calm voice. It's great for you to have a calm voice at all times, really, um, but you can use volume to express different things. Um, uh, you need to be clear in your calls. Timing's really important. So again, that exercise, I'll use an ex as an example. When you ask the crew to take take it away in stern pair or bow pair. Um, you could ask them to start at the back with their arms only, square blades, so they're rowing along with arms only. You can't ask them to move to bodies at any time. Okay, so they're rowing along, arms only, right? If you just say, let's move to bodies now, they're like, um, when? So you've got to be really clear on when you're doing that. So what I do is I tend to say, okay, um, on my call, we'll move to bodies. And, I'll, and if you think about where it is in the, in the stroke, that's where they, would come, where they would bring in the bodies. So they're rowing along, so you want them to go to bodies, and I'd say, on my call, um, we'll move to bodies. And I'll say, on this one, which gives them the most possible time before they come forward. It's a hard one, but you're gonna have to get used to it. The easy one is probably when they're going from like half slide to full slide. So they're rowing along sort of at half slide, and then you say to them, on my, on, on my call, we'll move to full slide. So they take, they take a stroke at half slide, and as soon as possible after that one, you say on the next one, full slide, which gives them, again, as much possible time to move out and take the next full stroke. So that's a timing thing, and a really good way, I guess, of learning that is to make a mistake. You'll see, if you don't call it at the right time, all four of them will do it at different times, there'll be confusion. If you do it at the right time, um, which is usually immediately after the catch, um, then that'll give them the most time before the next catch to go and do the next thing. And you'll see that when you make those calls at the right time, the crew will react well and the boat will be the least disturbed by doing that call. And same what you mentioned it as well, with the legs call, like if you're racing, um, you want to be very clear when you want them to, to do certain efforts. So if you're asking for 10 strokes on, on the leg drive, um, you don't ask for that, uh, you know, once, once they've taken a stroke. You want to give them notice. So I usually say breathing up for 10 strokes on the legs, in three, in two, on this one now. And the now is literally as they've put their blade into the, into the catch and they're about to drive their legs. And you want the now to be like now, right? And that's on the first one. And then on the next one, you want to be like legs down, you know, or knees down or drive back. And you want to say these things as they're doing what you're asking them to do. Same is true if uh, you ask them to do 10 on the arms. You don't ask them to do arms like when they're driving their legs. You want to say, let's do 10 on the arms on this one. And they've taken the now. And then you want to say, arm draw, you know, hold, hold in or whatever the calls are. And again, you can get a lot of that from the, from the coach. Um, but you want to time that so that it's relevant to what they're doing. And there's a rhythm to what you're saying. You want that rhythm to be part of what they're doing so that they feel encouraged to do it. Yeah. Yeah, you, look, you can, get, you can get timing from catch and finish timing. That's helpful. But you'll also get to the point where you, where you can get that from their bodies as well. Um, very difficult, as I said, I think you were not here right then, but it is difficult being a, in a Bowcox boat when your crew is new and you're new to rowing. Um, it's not ideal, but that's where I would really try and repeat a lot of what the coach is saying 
um, and feel what the coach is saying. Like when he says something or she says something, think to yourself, okay. And then when they're, when they're doing what they're asked to do, does that make a difference to what you're feeling in the boat? Um, you know, some of the easiest ones, I guess, in a Bowcox boat is if there's, if there's instability in the boat, the platform's not good, then you can always ask them to time the finish together or to tap down together. Those are things I think your coach will probably say, and that's what it's referring to, and you can repeat those things when you start to feel the problem that that coach, coaching call usually fixes. So that's stuff that you need to start trying to, trying to identify just from feeling what's going on in the boat. What did the coach say to do? Hold the finishes in or time the finishes, make that call and feel if the, if the boat then has a better platform. Yeah, look, uh, authority is really important. As I can't stress enough, um, it doesn't matter how old the people are in your crew or how experienced they are, you are responsible for the safety of the crew, number one, and actually you're also responsible for the success of the crew through the race plan. So if someone's mucking around or if someone is um, rude or disrespectful, you need to pull them up on that. Um, but hopefully it wouldn't get to that, but you certainly do need to express that in the authority in your voice. As I said, when you're landing a boat or when you're, even when you're training, there's really no time where you don't say anything as a coxswain without expecting uh, to, get the to get a response to it. That's to either improve the rowing through coaching or to execute the race plan or to ensure the safety of the crew on the water, etc. So authority, you have the authority. And if you don't feel you've got it, then I would talk to the, to the, to the coach first. And it might be that you and the coach call a meeting with the crew and you sit around and, you, and, and the coach says, when you are out on the water, the coxswain is the boss. Uh, just the way it has to be. Uh, and yes, motivation. Motivation, we talked about it with the leg drive and, and encouragement. Um, you know, encourage your crew, uh, inform your crew, tell them where they are at. Um, if, they're, if they're battling out with another crew, you can encourage them and say, look, you know, we're head to head. Let's really go for an effort on the legs, 10 strokes on the legs. Let's try and get, you know, half a foot with every stroke and tell them if that's working or if it's not. Um, if you're a long way behind, tell them where they're at, but don't, don't harp on it too much because that will discourage them. So you're trying to encourage them. Um, but it's good to keep them informed of where they're at, how they're going, where they're at on the race course as well. That's 500 metres gone, that's 1,000 metres, that's halfway, or 500 if it's halfway. Tell them where they're at. Um, uh, yeah, so motivate them to do their best. Is it worth saying like common motivation things that come on, um, push through, that kind of stuff? Come on, I would steer away from. Um, I'd say come on is one of those ones where it's equally as annoying as counting strokes it doesn't add any value. Come on doesn't, but drive your legs does, um, time the catching, ca the catch does, time the finish does. Um, again, it's sort of coaching stuff uh, will help them do it uh, and really committing to the, to the race plan. So if that's 10 on legs, then yes, drive the legs. Don't come on, but drive the legs. Be very specific about what you want them to do. You know, and if you, don't feel a, if you don't feel a response, ask for it again. Like I've had you know, good crews where you know, we've got 10 on the legs and I didn't feel anything and we're like, let's do that again. Didn't feel it, tell them, I didn't feel it. Let's go 10 on the legs again in three, in two, on this one now. And ask for it, demand it. Um, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is a good point as well. So, you know, before you get on the water, be clear what the session is with the crew. Um, but you need to be clear as well. You know, what is the coach looking to do that, that session? Generally, they'll talk to you about it before you get on the water. You need to be clear about that as well, especially if he's gonna ask you, he or she's gonna ask you to do an exercise you've not done before. You know, ask about that. As I said, the drills, um, explain the drills to me, speak with the coach. Yeah, how far are we going? That's a typical one even I do. It's like, where are we rowing to today? Are we going up to the island? Are we turning around? You know, are we on the water for an hour? Do we need to be off the water at a certain time? All of these things. And that's a good one to the coach as well. You know, is there something you want me to keep an eye on during the session and let you know what my thoughts were at the end of the session? 
Uh, yeah, during the session, raise a hand after the coach gives an instruction. So yes, so generally try and communicate with the coach uh, visually, not verbally. So if they're saying something and they say, okay, Coxon, um, we're gonna take it away, you know, um, stern pair only, I generally give, I look, I look in the direction of the coach and give him a wave, meaning I've heard you, yes, I'll do that. Um, uh, it says there, keep your hand raised if you don't understand. So generally, yeah, just stick your hand. It's an interesting call as well because this is a, a call that you would do at the start of a race if you're not happy for some reason to the umpire. So stick your hand right up in the air and sort of just look at your coach and he'll look at you and say, I don't understand or couldn't hear you or something like that. So you've got to try and communicate non-verbally if you can. Uh, yes. Don't know, maybe talk to the coach and say, can we agree on something? If I don't hit, understand it or if I don't hear it, what can, what can we do? Yeah, and come up with a little sign, you know? Maybe it's something like, something like that or, yeah, I don't get it or, yeah. Uh, and again, there's the glossary for that one. Jen, how are you going? Yeah. You got to go? Okay, we can do the other... We can do the other ones in the next session a little bit. So where we get up to, is it four? Yeah, we should move a little bit closer, uh, f faster through these.